So far, when we've looked at the idea of similarity between two matrices, we've done so largely algebraically to solve algebraic goals. And we notice that if you have two matrices that are similar, then they share, for instance, the same eigenvalues. And that we could use the process of diagonalization to attempt to take a matrix and show that it was similar to a diagonal one. And that process was algebraic as well. We algebraically computed eigenvalues, we algebraically computed eigenvectors, and we use those to make the similarity relation. Now, what we're going to do in this video is try to interpret similarity through the lens of transformations, and in particular, change of basis when I'm talking about a particular transformation. So let me establish the setting first. I want to suppose that I've got some matrix A, and that if I'm going to come along and take a P inverse AP, that this is going to be equal to some other matrix, and ideally it's a diagonal one when we can diagonalize it, but it's not always going to be a diagonal one, and everything that I say doesn't really matter whether it's diagonal or not, but I'm going to write diagonal because I just really like diagonal matrices. Now, in this scenario, I'm going to also suppose that I have a basis. So this is a basis, I write it with a little bit of a script, and it is going to be a list of vectors b1 down to bn. And final thing to note is I'm going to assert that the P matrix, this matrix that's crucial for the similarity relation, it's going to be the matrix whose columns are just going to be these basis vectors. Indeed, we can always find a relationship like this because in order for a matrix P to actually be invertible, it must have linearly independent columns. And therefore, those columns are going to form a basis for Rn. All right, so I've done my setup here. I have this similarity relationship between the matrix A and the matrix D, that the similarity relationship is defined in terms of this P matrix, and that the columns of the P matrix are going to form a basis that we denote by B. So now I want to think about what this transformation A does. Suppose that I start with some vector x. Then what the transformation does is that it takes this vector x and it spits out the vector ax. Now, because the B basis for Rn is indeed a basis, it means that we can write this vector x in terms of that basis. As in, we can say that this vector x can be written as some combination of the B1s all the way down to the Bn's. And in particular, that we can come along here and give some coefficient, how about I call it a1, and it sums all the way down to a n. So I can, I can therefore write this vector x in a linear combination in this way. But the vector ax is also an Rn because A is an n by n matrix, and so ax can also be written in this B basis. So the ax I have on the right-hand side can also be written as some linear combination of the Bn's, but I can no longer refer to them as A's because it's some different one, so how about I use C1 all the way up to Cn. So that's what my transformation does. It takes my vector x and spits out the vector ax, and I can write either of those in this basis. Now, because we have this basis, we also have associated two other vectors. They're the vector x written in the b basis, and they are the vector ax written in that b basis as well. And the way that you could construct these is that you looked at all of the coefficients for the uh, vector x, and that they came together, and the a1 down to the an was going to be equal to this vector x in the b basis, and, and the c1s and the cn's, that all of those sort of came down, and the ax written in the b basis was going to be the c1 down to the cn. So I can take my vector x and my vector ax, and I can write both of them in the b basis, which is just pulling out the coefficients. And in particular, we can relate the vector x and the vector x written in the b basis by that matrix p. 
So I'm going to write uh, two arrows. They're both going to point up. And they are applying the matrix P. And so that we really have three different arrows. The top one is applying the matrix A, but, but going from X written in the B basis to just X written in the standard basis is multiplication by P. Let's take a moment off on the side and just verify that this is indeed what we mean to say. Notice that if I take that P matrix and I multiply it to the vector X written in the B basis, well, this is just going to be equal to A1 times whatever the first thing in P is, which is B1, plus all the way down to AN plus whatever the nth thing in P is, which is going to be the BN. So indeed, we see that this is the relationship, that what we have transformed is P times X written in the B basis gets out my vector X. So I was justified in writing this arrow diagram. All right, so now let's return to the main problem. What I'm going to now ask is, how do I connect along the bottom? If I have a vector X written in my B basis, so I'm at this vector here, and I want to get over to the vector AX written in the B basis, the question is, what is the matrix that represents that transformation, the transformation that takes X written in the B basis to AX written in the B basis. It's not the matrix A, because the matrix A was going to apply when we had these written in the standard basis. So that is the key question that I'm trying to ask is, if I begin with this vector X, and I have it written in the B basis, then I want to try to multiply by something here, let me put that off on the side, multiply by something here, such that what I get out of it is AX written in the B basis. That is my goal. And this is the question mark that I want to fill in. But how can I do that? Well, one way that I can get from X written in the B basis to AX written in the B basis is I can go the long way around on my path. That, that I can go in some approach that takes the XB, goes up through the X, over to the AX, and back down. That's the approach that I'm going to take. All right, so first I'm gonna multiply by my P, so I'm gonna come and write that closer to the X, because that's the first thing I do. And then I go up here on the top and I multiply out by my A. And then I'm coming down here, and notice carefully the direction of my arrows. The, the P is going from the bottom to the top, but I'm trying to get from the top to the bottom, so I have to multiply here by P inverse. And that's what we now have. We've got some matrix, P inverse times A times P, when you multiply that by X in the B basis, you get AX in the B basis. And then finally, we had all the way up at the beginning that by a similarity relationship, the P inverse AP, that's exactly what I have, was just equal to this matrix that I denoted by D. And so my final conclusion here is going to be able to say that D times X written inside of the B basis, it's just going to be equal to AX written in terms of the B basis. So what's the big takeaway? We began with two matrices, A and D, that were similar, that there was this matrix P so that you could have the similarity relationship between them. And then what we've interpreted this as is that the P matrix that allows for this relation, if you write out the basis that's just the columns of that P matrix, then this entire similarity relation can just be thought of as a change in basis, where instead of having a matrix A taking X to AX, you have this other matrix, the D matrix, that takes X in the B basis to AX in the B basis. And thus, we have this really nice geometric interpretation of similarity. And it should also then sort of make sense that so many of these properties of our matrix do carry over, that, that when you have a similar relationship between two different matrices, the matrices share a lot of the same properties. And this is because the, the two matrices that you really have are, in a sense, both representing the same transformation, but they're representing it in different bases. And that's why they're so similar in so many different regards.